Hi students, welcome to HSC Chemistry and Applying Chemical Ideas, which is Module 8. This is video number 13, and we're going to be looking at nuclear magnetic resonance. As a concept, the idea of NMR is uh, quite complex, and so as a result, I think uh, what I'm trying to do here is to give you a very little bit of background uh, to NMR and really focus more on how we analyze the data that are produced as a result of nuclear magnetic resonance. We're focusing on proton and carbon-13, so specifically what we want to try and do here is understand why we use these two and what sort of information they can give us about the nature and identity of organic compounds. So here's a little bit of a, a quick cooks tour through nuclear magnetic resonance and it's a little bit tricky um, so let's just see if we can accept a few things and move on to the analytical stage. The important thing is that what we've looked at in spectra up to this point is the movement of electrons. So electrons moving from a ground state to an excited state and they do that by taking in a certain amount of electromagnetic radiation. This time when we're looking at nuclear magnetic resonance, and really the name is uh, the clue to exactly what's going on here, we're not looking at the electrons now, we're looking at the nucleons, that is the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus and how they respond to an external magnetic field. The underlying physics associated with this is really uh, quite complex and m involves really more quantum level understandings which I do believe are beyond the scope of the chemistry course. Nevertheless if we can accept a few things a little bit on faith and by all means have a, a, bit, a look at these in a bit more detail to go into a bit more depth um, particularly if you're also doing physics because I think the two things will um, dovetail together very very nicely. But what we want to understand is that a new, uh, the nucleus of an atom will display this um, concept or this property of spin if it has an odd mass number. And this is one of the reasons why we look at proton NMR and we also look at carbon-13 NMR. We do know, or hopefully we do know, that the most common isotope of carbon is carbon-12, but carbon-12 would be an even-numbered mass for the nucleus of carbon, so we can't use it. Um, it doesn't show the effects that we want, so we need to use carbon-13. The concept is that atomic nuclei act like small bar magnets and this is a property, a physics property, where we um, look at the interaction between uh, electricity and magnetism and that is if we have moving charges they can generate a magnetic field, an induced magnetic field and of course if we change magnetic fields we can induce a current. So these two things, uh, Ersted and Faraday's um, discoveries are uh, applicable right at this tiny level as well. There are some limitations and some um, generalized assumptions that we're making here, but if you just think about the fact that little charged particles can create uh, by their movement small magnetic fields, and we've kind of explained this in terms of things like domains when we've talked about um, the magnetic properties of certain types of um, elements, for example, iron. Um, so the principle is if these little moving charges can create little tiny magnetic fields then they can act like little tiny bar magnets, that is they can line up in terms of a north and a south pole and therefore if we place an external magnetic field around these nuclei then the magnetic fields will align. They'll either be um, directly aligned to the magnetic field, so in the same uh, orientation, and that's the lower energy one, or they'll oppose the uh, magnetic field. So they'll be uh, exactly back to front, if you like. So um, in terms of uh, them aligning with the north-south pole, if they're aligned to the external magnetic field, then they are at a low energy, and if they're um, opposed, then they'll be at a higher energy. Um, and so the higher energy because they'll want to rotate in order to um, return to that sort of uh, more ground, uh, more stable state. So electromagnetic radiation can be absorbed. Obviously, it's more likely to be absorbed by um, those at a lower energy state that can then flip into that higher energy state in the same way that we've said the electrons can absorb energy to go from a ground state to an excited state in terms of their 
uh, orbital shell movement. Now, if this was the only thing that happened, then that would mean that every hydrogen-1 nucleus and every carbon-13 nucleus would all give off exactly the same pattern because they would set in a similar thing, or at least they'd be close enough that there'd be very little difference between them. The problem is that with electrons on the outside, electrons are charged particles. These are charged particles that are moving. They will also have magnetic fields associated with them. They're much smaller mass, so there will be a difference in the strength. But nevertheless, this disrupts the patterns that we are likely to see, and that disruption um, gets magnified depending on how those electrons are distributed, uh, i.e. what they're bonding to. So. Are they bonded to uh, uh, double bonds? Are they in a high region of electron density? Are they bonded to oxygens? Is there a, a difference in electronegativity that's creating levels of polarity? There's lots of different options that we can have, and those are reflected in the different functional groups that we have, particularly around those carbon atoms. And so that's what produces these different patterns of um, NMR outputs that we see. It's a little bit... Um, oversimplified I'm aware of that but uh, and it's definitely worth having a little bit of a look I can recommend uh, a resource called a spectroscopy in a suitcase I think that's a really nice pictorial uh, representation of a lot of these different types of spectra that are really useful um, to get a little bit more detail and obviously there's a huge amount of stuff on the um, internet about this type of um, chemistry or physics uh, and so you can go into heaps and heaps of detail. But the main thing that we want to do is we want to know how to apply the technique of NMR. So this is our data table. We can see that this is one of the things that we're going to be provided with in terms of our um, data sheets. So you can see this is relating to carbon-13 nuclear magnetic resonance. And you can, and as you look down, you see slightly different values or different ranges of values. Now the one problem that we have is this degree of overlap. And just as we've had to worry about nomenclature uh, and how it's affected by ambiguity, so ambiguity is now going to creep into some of our analysis of spectra. And the reason for that is because some of these values are a little bit uh, or are contained within different ranges. If, for example, I was to look at this first peak uh, on my um, spectra, I would notice that it's occurring a little bit under the 20 mark. And so that would suggest to me that I have a um, maybe uh, seven, uh, 19, 18 that I'm looking at. So if I'm looking at a value, let's call it 19, uh, it fits in here, it fits in here. No, it's kind of close here, maybe not, and then nowhere else. So is it a carbon-hydrogen bond or is there a halogen attached to it? Well, because I know this is ethanol, I know that it's the uh, carbon-hydrogen bond. Uh, what's what's difficult is if I didn't know. If I didn't know, then I'd have to do some other things in order to try and see if I could uh, eliminate the halogen or confirm the presence of one or more halogens. So, um, so this is one of the little problems that we have when we're trying to read the, sp the spectra for NMR, is that sometimes these peaks are occurring at, um, at places where there can be more than one solution. You can see there's another one that's occurring up here around the 59 mark. So we'll call that one 59 and we'll call that one 19. And at the 59 mark, well, yeah, no, this one possibly, uh, this one, uh, and then we're all right after that. So again, we've got two options that we can look at for the peaks that have occurred here. So um, again, what we know is that we're looking at ethanol. So we are looking at this uh, hydroxyl functional group right here. And so therefore we know that it's actually this one and this one that we're looking at. There's no halogen and uh, there's no amine group on the end either. Now that's fine when we know what it is and we know what we're, we're expected to get, but what if we don't? What if I just gave you this uh, output data without telling you that it was the spectra of ethanol? Could you confirm that it was ethanol? Well, as you've just seen, that you can't directly, but there are other pieces of information that we might be able to get to help us out. 
what we have here uh, in general are two peaks. Now two peaks tells us that there's at least two carbons. It's possible that if the molecule is symmetrical and therefore the types of environments that we find for the carbons are similar, that is say for another, if, if we extended this molecule on and say had our OH group in the central carbon and formed another one beyond, it may well be that that symmetry creates the same number of peaks because we've still only got two different types of carbon environments. And this is one of the things that's important when you look at it. The simplest thing to do is to see two peaks and say, well, it's got two carbons. It's a good starting point, but you'll still need other things to see if you can confirm um, what you think is the case. One extra piece of information that we can use to help us to try and identify what's going on here is to also look at the proton NMR or the hydrogen one NMR for ethanol. And we can see that on the next slide. So here is the uh, proton NMR for ethanol. You can see what's happening here is we have um, three different environments for the hydrogen. So this time what we have is these three different hydrogen environments. And as a result of that, this is starting to give us a little bit more information, particularly around our, our potential symmetries of different molecules that we can identify for ethanol. And you'll You'll remember that this time we're actually working from something that we know. We already know that we're looking at ethanol. And we can see that the three different environments are a hydrogen that is attached to an oxygen, a hydrogen that is attached to a carbon, which is also attached to one other hydrogen, and a hydrogen that's attached to a carbon that has two other hydrogens. So effectively, we have a CH3 group a CH2 group and an OH group. Part of what we want to try and do with these is to have a look at where they are, where each of these um, groups is and how the output data helps us to identify that. When we do that, we look at, we're looking for the high resolution peaks. The high resolution peaks so show splitting into smaller clusters and this is based on the n plus one or neighbors plus one rule. So you can actually see that in these types of environments, we're going to have neighbors that are going to identify each of these three groups. So if we talk about the neighbor of the CH3 group, the neighbor of the CH3 group is the CH2. So it's a carbon that contains two hydrogens. If we add one, 2 plus 1 is 3. So for this particular species here, we have a neighbor that has 1, 2, 3 of these little cluster peaks and therefore must be 3 minus 1, which is 2 hydrogens. So this is an environment, this is a neighbor that has 2 hydrogens. If we look specifically at our CH2 group, then what we notice is that our CH2 group has an oxygen attached and a carbon with three hydrogens. So there are three uh, hydrogens attached here and therefore with our N plus one rule, three plus one is four, then we have in this region here, four of these little peaks. We actually have four um, of these little clusters, which indicate to us that this particular species is located next to a CH3. Now, the problem that we have is that the information that we're getting is, we, is the information we're getting about neighbors, not about the actual um, carbon itself. So we've got to put all of this data together to get a sense of exactly what's going on here. This OH, um, this OH hydrogen over here is a normal position for a hydroxyl functional group. Um, and it is something that, that will appear occasionally in some of these outputs. And usually you'll be able to identify it straight away as an OH um, functional group. When we put this information together with the outputs that we got from our carbon 13 NMR, we're starting to get a bit of an idea of the different types and numbers of carbon and hydrogen environments that we have. And so we can start to make some more um, 
direct conclusions about exactly what types of molecules that we have. On most occasions, spectra will include this um, TM. S trimethylsilane, which is at the zero mark as a standard reference point. So you will sometimes see just a little peak uh, at the zero mark, which is just telling you that the standard has been used. What happens then is the numbers will move away from that um, zero mark to the left on the X axis and the sharp peaks will correspond to particular carbons or hydrogens within the molecule. What we'll know is that every different peak represents a different environment. For carbon, that's easy because it starts to tell us how many different types of carbons there are at an absolute minimum. As I said, two peaks means a minimum of two carbons and potentially more. And the hydrogens will split into those little peak clusters and those will tell us about how many different hydrogens there are in the neighboring atom. Spectra also help to identify some aspects of the structure of the molecule. They may not always be definitive and we may again need to use NMR in um, partnership with other data in order to make uh, exact conclusions, but at least we can get some um, general ideas. And if all of the carbon environments in a particular molecule were identical, then we may simply have a single peak. So don't forget the peaks are just telling us about a different type of environment. And if that environment occurs several times in the molecule, it'll still only show us that one peak. So <clears throat> here's another one just for comparative purposes. And you see this time we do have the TMS identified. So again, you can see that there's a peak that's occurring here around the 17, 18 mark. And another one that's occurring up here around the 37, 38 mark. So we would need to go and have a look at these in order to try and get an idea of what we're actually looking at. One of these is actually corresponding to a carbon environment which contains um, carbon-hydrogen bonds. And one of these is telling us that there is actually a bond to a halogen present in the molecule. Again, it doesn't tell us if there are... Uh, other places in this molecule where this occurs, all it is doing is giving us a bit of an idea about um, how many different types of environments there are. And again, two peaks means we know that there is at least two carbons, two plus carbons, um, and in this case, there are only the two. So that's, that's sort of telling us about the two different types of environments. Um, and the types of bondings that we can see that are present there. To get a little bit more information, we look at the proton NMR. And you'll notice here that we've labeled the hydrogens to give us a little indication about what's going on. Now, interestingly enough, if this was ethane rather than chloroethane, then you would notice that that carbon-chlorine bond would disappear. We actually have symmetry then. So each carbon would be bonded to another carbon that's bonded to three hydrogens. And so you would not see one of uh, both of these uh, double peaks in these two outputs. But because of that chlorine is there, that means that we have one carbon where the hydrogens are attached to a neighbor with three hydrogens and therefore um, that is going to uh, produce a, an output with four peaks. So three plus one is four. And of course, the other carbon has uh, a neighbor which has two hydrogens and a chlorine. And the chlorine is not going to be part of this, but the hydrogens will. So therefore, if we count the number of hydrogens over here, we have two uh, plus one, which gives us three of these little cluster peaks all together. So that's how we can put this information together. NMR is probably the most complex of the spectroscopy techniques, and I have sped through it. So we've looked at um, it in very, very um, broad detail. I know that we can look at some more of these in a little bit more detail and actually start to get an idea of how we solve some of these problems um, in more examples in class. So thanks for watching.